All right, now in Revelation chapter 3 here, it's um, it, Revelation chapter 3 is tied in with Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2 and 3 are both a lot of uh, messages given to churches at the time of uh, John's writing here. John was the one that received a revelation from Jesus Christ. And um, in, the, in the beginning chapters, you know, it's not dealing so much with the prophecies. That comes a little bit later. But here in chapters 2 and chapters 3, he's given these messages under the angel of these churches, like each, each church. Um, you know, the pastors are giving these messages, and, and, and there's all these different things going on here. And we're going to focus in on the church of the Laodiceans, and that starts in verse number 14. So in verse number 14, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, let me just admit, before we get any further, you know, these are all admonitions to churches, to literal churches that existed back in this time. And I think they're still applicable today, even though like we may not be going through the exact same things that they were doing. A lot of these truths, I mean, these things happen to churches in general. And we can take these admonitions, we can take these truths, we can take these teachings and just apply them to ourselves and apply them to, to the church that we have here. And, and take warnings here and just say, okay, well, this is what they were going through. Let's, let's learn from, what they, from their mistakes and the things that they did good and the things that they did bad. And let's just apply that to ourselves. All of this stuff is applicable today. Um, we, you know, we don't believe in, in all these dispensations and say, oh, well, this is only talking about a certain age. I don't believe in that nonsense. I believe that there are real churches that these messages were given to that John had to write these letters to these churches for them to read. And there were things that were literally going on in their church. But there are also things that we can learn from today. So we're going to try to get some learning here from, from the church of Laodicea. It says in verse 15, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So God said, look, I know your works. He's looking at their works, right? He's saying, what are you doing for me? What kind of works are you doing for me? He looks at me and says, it's, it's not cold, but it's not hot. You know, maybe it's not that they're not doing anything at all. They're not completely cold. He says, but you're definitely not hot. He says, you're just, you're just lukewarm. And he says, because you're lukewarm, because you're just kind of half in, half out, you're kind of just, just going through the motions and just doing some things, you know, you're not on fire for God, you're not really serving me with much zeal. He says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Now think about that. Like, if God were to say to you, just individually, obviously he's talking to a church here, but apply this just to yourself individually. If God says, I know your works, and he says, you're so lukewarm, I just want to spew you out of my mouth. I mean, how would that make you feel? That, that would be a shame in order for God to say something like that. Like, I just want you out of here. I just want you just out of my mouth. I'm just going to spit you out because you're just bringing shame to me. That I want you on fire for me. I want you hot. I want you serving me. And at the very least, just be cold. He's like, but don't do this half in, half out stuff. Don't go halfway. Don't just be kind of warm. It's kind of in the middle of the road. He says in verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. So here they're just trusting and oh, well, we're doing so well. Everything is going great. We have all these goods. Hey, we're just, we're just going to coast and just, just let everything go. And, and we're just fine. They think they're doing so well. It says they have need of nothing. Yeah, we don't need anything. And you know what? Having riches just physically in this world will kind of has a tendency to give people that attitude. And that's why it's important to always, you know, first of all, be content with what you have. Don't be desirous of, of having riches and all this other stuff. But let's say God blesses you with that and, and you do happen to have like more money. Don't let that lift your heart up with pride. You still have to maintain a humble attitude. That's why in Proverbs 30, you know, the, the, the man, you know, the author of that is saying like, you know, the man who penned down is saying, look, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to be poor. I don't want to have to steal and beg bread. He's like, but I also don't want to be rich and deny God. You know, we ought not to desire to be rich. If you happen to be blessed with some extra goods, hey, make sure you keep yourself humble. You don't want to have this attitude again like this church at Laodicea had, thinking, whoa, I'm increased with goods. Hey, I don't have need of anything. When you don't have need of anything, you stop relying on God. We need to understand, no, we have to rely on God daily. Every single day, we need to be relying on Him. No matter how much money you have, no matter how much goods you have, no matter how well you think things are going in your life, you need God every single day of your life. 
Back, you know, similarly, the, the sermon I preached on manna, the bread that came out from heaven. Hey, you need to eat, you know, every day, basically. Obviously, you go a few days without eating, but you need, you need that food to survive. We need to rely on God. We need to rely on the bread from heaven, and we need to never lose sight of that, that we need Him to survive. We need Him to get through. It says in the middle of verse 17, And knowest not, so he's saying, You think you have all, you're, you're increasing riches, you don't need anything, but you don't even know that thou art wretched, and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So they look at themselves, they think, hey, we're doing pretty good. Hey, we're, everything's just fine. We have need of nothing. But in God's view, he looks at me and said, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're blind. He says, you're poor, you're naked. You know, it's a shame. You're shameful. You're just, you're just, you're just exposed. You're naked. You're poor. You're miserable. You're wretched. That's the way God viewed him. Now, that's not the way they viewed himself, but God, that's why God's giving them this message saying, hey, look, you don't realize this, but this is how you look in my eyes. You're lukewarm, you're half in, half out, you're wishy-washy, you're not doing the works, I see what you're doing, and it makes me want to spew you out of my mouth. And this sermon this morning is, is designed, it's, I want this to be an admonition for us all, to, to analyze your own self, analyze what you're doing for God, and think, what can I do more for God? How can I serve God fervently because this is what he tells them to do in verse 18 he says i counsel thee so this is what the advice he's given them to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich now gold tried in the fire i believe this is alluding to the works that we can that when when we do good works on this earth you know we can lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven it's, it's the good works that are going to abide the judgment seat of Christ that aren't just going to get burned up. The gold, the, the silver, the precious stones, these things are of lasting value. So he's saying to buy of me that, that gold, right? So the gold is not, he's not talking about physical gold they have on this earth. He's talking about that spiritual gold, you know, winning souls, doing the work that he set out for us to do, doing those types of things. Hey, that's going to earn you those, that's going to get you that gold. That's how you can buy that gold from God and lay it up for yourself in heaven. This is what he's counseling to do. He says, in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. See, I think a lot of people in this church weren't even saved. And, I mean, being clothed upon, hey, getting those white garments, you get that when, you know, when you're saved. When we go into heaven, we're all, anyone, all the children of God are going to receive that white garment. That's something that's going to cover nakedness. And he said, you know, in this church had a lot of people, I believe, in it that, were, that they weren't even saved. And there's some people were, but they, just, they were just probably going liberal, probably just, just, hey, we've got all these riches, we got all this money, everything's going fine, we don't need anything, we're doing great. And they were wretched poor, they were, they were naked. You know, and he says, look, you need, you need to get this stuff taken care of. In verse 19, it says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And that's the title of my sermon this morning, be zealous and repent. So because of the fact, he said, because of the fact that as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Hey, if God loved you this morning, he will rebuke you when you need rebuke, and he will discipline you, he will chasten you when you need that chastening. We need to keep this in mind. Now, it's not pleasant to go through life constantly being disciplined. I mean, if he loves you, he'll do it. And if you're saved today, God loves you. You know that. God, God loved you enough to, to pay for all of your sins. If you accept that gift, guaranteed God loves you. You're a child of God. But you have to remember, every, you know, if he loves you, he's also going to rebuke you. He's going to chasten you. And he says, that's why, he says, therefore, you need to be zealous and repent, repent, change. Look, if you're not doing very many works for God, if you're not on fire for God, if you're not zealous, if you're not excited for serving God, change. You need to repent. You need to change what you're doing. And, um, and get on board with that. He wants us, God doesn't want you to get to the place where you just become complacent in serving Him. He wants you to be excited. He wants you to have a zeal. He wants you to be zealous. And He wants us always pushing to do a little bit more for Him. There's always more that we can be done. Now let me ask you this. We're going back to, to this lukewarm. Saying they were lukewarm, they're not cold, they're not hot, right? Is it very comfortable to just be cold? I mean, if you're just out and it's freezing and like you don't have any clothing, like you just have very little, you're out of shorts and a t-shirt and there's snow on the ground, sub-zero, being cold, being freezing cold, that's not comfortable. Not at all, right? Or how about hot? You're out in 120 degrees down in Phoenix, 
and you're just out there just sweating away. Hey, that's not very comfortable either. But how about lukewarm? Okay. That's pretty comfortable, right? That, that's, that's something you can sit back, take it easy. Hey, I'm doing great. It's very comfortable. There's no, there's no waves, nothing's being stirred up. There's no problems. Everything just feels great. But God says, that's not the way I want you to live your life. I don't want you to be lukewarm. I don't want you just getting comfortable and just sitting back and thinking, hey, everything's going great. Yeah, I'm just fine. I've got goods. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm content. Uh, I've got everything I need, and, and I'm just going to sit back and, and, and coast. God doesn't want you doing that. He wants you hot. Being hot is not comfortable. Right? It could be unpleasant, uncomfortable, but that's what he wants you to do. You have to get uncomfortable to serve God. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 14. I'm going to read for you out of Philippians 4. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 11, it says, Not that I speak in respect of what, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So we ought to be content with the things that we have no matter what. Whether you have a lot of things, we have a little things, be content with that. He says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. So whether, whether he's brought really low, whether he's brought really high, I know how to deal with each situation. It says, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So even if you're not hungry, hey, you need to know how to be hungry. You need to know how to abound. You need to know how to deal with these things so that you can stay on fire and stay zealous for serving God so you don't get complacent. You don't get to this place where you're just lukewarm and you're not doing anything for him. Verse, Philippians 4.13, of course, is a famous verse that says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. No matter how hot things are, no matter how, hot, no matter how hard things get, you can do all things through Christ. Because Christ is the one that will strengthen you. You're in Matthew 14. Look at verse number 26. Matthew 14, verse 26. This is the story of, um, of Peter when he gets out of the boat. It says in verse 26, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, talking about Jesus Christ, they were troubled, saying it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. So they're out in the middle of the sea. They're on a boat. And they see Jesus Christ walking by on the water. And they get scared, and they're thinking like, it's a spirit, and they're just crying out because they're afraid. They're just like, like look at that. There's, like, there's a spirit out there on the, in the middle of the lake, you know? And, uh, and they see this, but it says in verse 27, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Don't worry. Right? It's, not, it's not some spirit. It's me. It's Jesus. I'm, I'm, don't worry about it. Verse 28, it says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come un come." unto thee on the water. So Peter's like, okay, if it's really you, Jesus, why don't you ask me to come out on the water? So he does. In verse 29, he says, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, I love this story because Peter's actually the one, he's willing to get out of the boat. Now, there's a lot of safety in that boat, right? There's a storm, there's waves, there's other things going on. You're in the boat. You're relatively safe, right? I mean, if you're in the middle of the, the ocean or the middle of this lake, I mean, you could drown. You think about getting out of that boat, it's, gonna, it's, it's not comfortable, right? I mean, this is, and this is what I'm trying to explain, like, you know, we don't want to get to a point where we're just living comfortably and everything just, just seems to be coasting along just fine. We need to be doing things and pushing ourselves to serve God so that, hey, you know what, maybe it is a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe that is going to be tiring. Maybe it is going to require some work. But we're willing to work. Peter here was willing to, to just, by faith, just get out of that boat. Hey, it's safe in the boat. Hey, I could just sit here and everything will be just fine. And, and we're going along good. We're going to make it to the other side. Peter said, no, I'm going to get out of the boat. Jesus is out of the boat. I'm going to get by Jesus. I'm going to get a little bit closer to Jesus. I'm going to ask him to come to me. Hey, if Jesus says to come unto me, I'm going to come unto him. If that means getting out of my safety net, if that means getting out of this place where I feel so safe and secure, getting out of this boat and just stepping out into the water, where normally you just sink down and, and you know, we wouldn't be able to do it. But hey, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Christ was able to allow him to walk on this water. It's an amazing miracle. I mean, Jesus Christ walking in the water. No other disciple, no one else was able to walk in that water. But Peter was able to because he was willing to get out of that comfort zone and willing by faith to just step out. He was able to start walking on water. 
Now, yeah, he had a little bit of fear, and, and, and he started to sink, right? He started to doubt. He started to, to lose some of that faith when he saw the big waves coming up. And, and you could understand that, right? I mean, as, as a human being. But with the faith of God, you know, Jesus is just saying, and he was right there. Look at, when, when he called on a guy, he said, Lord, save me. The Bible says, and immediately Jesus reached forth his hand to save him. I mean, he didn't waste a second. When he needed help and he called on Jesus to save him, this is a great picture of salvation. You know you need Jesus Christ. You know you're going to die and go to hell. You call out to Jesus, hey, immediately he's going to reach out his hand and save you. You don't have to wait for that. He's waiting there ready to save you and pull you out of that fire. Pull you out of that water, so to speak. Um, but he was right there for him. Now, we need to have that faith and understand that, hey, we might be in situations or even put ourselves in situations that they're not going to be very comfortable. There might be all these dangers around us. Right? These big waves coming up that's like, man, that wave's going to topple over me. What am I going to do? Don't get fearful. Don't get scared. If you're serving God, if you're going to Christ, which is what he was doing, he was walking to Christ. He was going towards Christ. He was on the right path. He was going the right way. He was literally walking on water, going to Jesus Christ. Hey, some big thing comes up in your life, some big event, it's just, wow, it's going to topple over me. What am I going to do? Don't get scared. Keep on the same path. He could have kept, I firmly believe he could have kept on that same, path, that same path and nothing would have harmed him and he would have made it all the way to Jesus Christ. He doubted a little bit. And again, I mean, you could understand it, but, um, but he, he got out of his comfort zone. He was able to do this and, and was able to do something that no one else was able to do, which is walk on water. And he was able even after that then to say, hey, I was able to walk on water with Jesus Christ. And that's pretty cool. I mean, that's a great thing to be able to look back on your life and be like, I'm so glad that I didn't allow my own fear, my own comfort level, my own whatever, to prevent me from doing something so great. I mean, how cool is that? Once he did that, it's like, he did it. It's great. You can, you can look back and say, man, that's awesome. If you want to grow as a Christian, you can't expect that everything is just going to come easy. If you're waiting for everything just to happen easily, it's not going to come. It's not going to happen. You have to be willing to sacrifice your time, your energy, your effort if you're really going to serve God the way that He wants you to. If you're going to get on fire for Him, it's going to require some faith and it's going to require some work, some work and some effort. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to go so when it's convenient for me because guess what? It's never going to be convenient. If you just say, oh, well, whenever I finally get time, okay, when I, when I get all the things done around the house that I need to do, when I put in all the hours at work that I need to do, when I do everything else in my life that I need to do, then I'm going to serve God. That is never going to come. That is never going to happen. You have to decide for yourself, you know what? This is going to require extra work for me. Hey, in order for me to get everything else done, if I'm going to serve God, I'm going to serve God first, but then it's going to require me to work even harder to get everything else done. That's just the way it is. And that's the way it's going to be. You have to decide for yourself. Do you want to be fervent in spirit? Do you want to serve God zealously? Do you want to be a Christian where he's not going to want to spit you out of his mouth? Do you want to do those works for him? We are God's servants. We're his laborers. It's work. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. There's a reason why we're called laborers. There's a reason why we're his servants. You know, he's not here to serve us. We ask Him for things, and He's a great Father, and He'll take care of us and take care of our needs. But we're His servants, and we better not lose sight of that. We're His laborers. We're His workers. We have a job to do. As I said this morning, He's got a plan for our lives. And that plan involves working and doing things for Him that, that He has designed for us to do. It's not just coasting through life and just everything's just going to come easy to me. That's not it at all. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 1. It says, we then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, excuse me, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, 
by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. You look through this list, there are a lot of things in this list that are not very comfortable. A lot. I mean, he's talking about stripes. Stripes means being whipped so that you can see the blood coming out of your body as a stripe. Where someone whips you and leaves a big bloody mark. That's not very comfortable. That, that, that's going to hurt. In imprisonment, imprisonments, being cast into prison, tumults, labors, working, right? Watchings, just, just being steadfast. Fastings, not eating food, right? He said earlier in uh, afflictions, necessities, distresses, where your troubles. Hey, all of these things are not pleasant things to go through. But in all of those things, we need to be serving Christ. Giving no offense in anything, says that the ministry be not blamed. So no matter what you're going through, all these troubles, all these, all these hardships, hey, if you're serving God, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not just going to come easy if you're doing them the way that he wants you to. But we need to give no offense to those things that the ministry be not blamed. See, when you, when you back down and back off because things just get too hard, and when you just quit and you say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore, now all of a sudden that's going to bring the ministry down. That's going to, that's going to bring the, the name of Christ down. People are going to look at that and just see a failure and say, oh, yeah, you didn't do anything. You know, and, and they'll mock the work that you do for Christ because normally then when you decide to quit, then you're going to start getting into sin and start doing other things. And you're not, there's no way you can serve two masters. When you stop serving God, you're going to start serving money. You're going to start serving something else. Okay? And, and when you get out, it's going to bring Christ's name down. Because people look at you and say, oh man, this guy was on fire. This guy was serving God. And people look at that, and they're just waiting for you to just, to just stop and quit and give up. Because now, then they'll just end up ridiculing you and saying, oh yeah, he called himself a Christian. Now look at him. And, and, and it's unfortunate. It happens. You know, people slip and fall. And hey, they shouldn't be doing that, you know, and, and, and judging Christ based on the person, but people do it. And we need to be aware of that too. Whether it's right for them to do or not, you know, we need to give the ministry and not, and not give blame, not give offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, as it said in verse number uh, three there. You're in 2 Corinthians, just flip over a few more chapters to chapter 11. And again, we're going to see here a little bit about the Apostle Paul. Now, Apostle Paul is arguably probably one of the greatest Christians who have ever lived. I mean, he did so much for the cause of Christ. I mean, he changed his life completely. Obviously, he was, he was against Christ. He was doing all these things. He was persecuting the church. But man, when, when, when he got saved, he had a zeal and he had a fervent spirit to serve Christ and was willing to give up everything to serve him. And, and he's a great example. I love the Apostle Paul and all, and all the things that he did, and all the things that he went through um, to use as, as admonition for ourselves and as edification to just help us to understand, hey, look, if Paul was able to go through all of these things, can we at least suffer a little bit? I mean, can we at least say, yeah, I know it's, you know, 40 degrees outside, it's a little bit cold, or 30 degrees outside, it's a little cold, but I'm still going to go out, I'm going to knock on those doors. I'm still going to go out when it's you know, 110 and, and knock on those doors and give someone the gospel. I can at least suffer that much. I can at least do that much for God. Look at what Paul went through. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. Look at verse number 23. And this is where he's going to start comparing himself. Because what, what people were doing is they were saying like, oh yeah, they were, they were disrespecting Paul. They were saying, you know, a lot of people were thinking that they were so spiritual. They were so holy. So Paul's going to kind of like, in a way, he's like kind of going down at their level and kind of speaking to them on, on what, what the way that they think. So in verse 23, it says, are they ministers of Christ? That's why it says, here I speak as a fool. Says, I'm, I'm, now I'm going to start talking like them. He says, I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes, above measure. You can't even count how many times he was whipped. In prisons, more frequent, in deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, say one. Five times he was whipped, 39 times. Five times. Thrice was I beaten with rods. So they billy clubbed him three times. 
Once was I stoned, people picked up rocks and just stoned him until they thought he was dead. We read that earlier in the book of Acts in the, in the Bible study. Three times, thrice I suffered shipwreck. He was out of sea and, and the ship just it was destroyed wherever he suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, just out in the middle of nowhere, just floating in the water for a night and a day, right? Um, verse 26, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brothers. I mean, it doesn't matter where he is. He could be in the city, he's in the sea, he's out in the wilderness. He's in perils. He's in troubles. He has all these things coming against him. All of these things. Yet he still stays faithful. Yet he still stays on path. He still is keeping the course and serving God. Verse number 27, he continues, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So yeah, besides all of these other things that are happening to me exteriorly while I'm going through and doing all this stuff, stuff I'm also taking care of the churches daily. I'm also ministering. I'm also serving other people. I'm also taking care of the needs of the church, of the people within the church. Yeah, every, if everything else isn't enough, I'm also doing this, right? That's not a comfortable lifestyle. That's not something that's going to be like, oh, I'm just going to coast through, right? But that's how you get a lot done for Christ. That's the type of thing that you go through to really serve God to the utmost and really lay up those, those treasures in heaven. Let's continue reading here in verse number 29. He says, Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window and a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped by his, <laughs> escaped his hands. So he's saying, like, I mean, these people were after me to the point where I had to be let down of a window and a basket. They had to lower me down so I could just escape and get away. I mean, everybody was after him. Now, again, the purpose of the sermon this evening is for you. I want to try to get you to be motivated, take action in your own life, and to decide, say, you know what, I'm going to serve God. I don't want to be a lukewarm Christian. I want to really start doing things. I can see the example that Paul left. I can see the example that Jesus Christ left. I mean, that guy I don't think ever slept. He was always doing work for his father. He was always doing the things that pleased God. And we can see the hard work, we can see the suffering, we can see the things that they went through. It wasn't an easy way to live. It wasn't an easy life. But hey, that's how we're going to please God. If you're saved this morning, you're not really doing anything for God. I mean, judge for yourself. I'm not here to judge you and say, you're doing stuff for God or you're not doing stuff for God. That's not my job. Okay, that's, that's for you to decide. It's not, a, that's between you and God. Okay, but analyze yourself. And, and think, and if you think that, you know what, his message to the Laodiceans applies to me, if you think that, that's what, that that applies to you, take his advice, take his counsel, repent, change, be zealously affected towards God, stir up your heart, and you know what, maybe you'll think that like, well, I, I don't know how to get on fire for I don't, I don't know how to, how, to, how to get that type of zeal, how to get that type of emotion, I'll tell you what, it starts with just, just starting to do more, okay, maybe your spirit isn't quite in it yet. But keep doing more for God. I'll tell you what, there's been plenty of times that I could think of where I didn't want to go out soul winning. I didn't want to go out preaching the gospel because I had other things to do. Maybe it was hot outside. Maybe it just wasn't a convenient time. You know, like, no, I got too many things to do. Oh, I didn't get very much sleep last night. I'm super tired. I just want to go to bed. Right? All these times, these, these are real issues that come up. I'm just being honest with you. These are things that happen to me that... When I don't, you know, it's cold outside, I ain't enough sleep, you know, there's, there's all these other projects I need to take care of, excuses that come up to make me just not want to go out solo. And it happens all the time. But I'll tell you what, there's never once been a time where I've gone out solo and I've actually gone out and done it, where I've been like, man, I wish I didn't spend that time out knocking on doors and preaching the gospel. Not one time do you ever regret doing it. But there's been many times where I've regretted saying, man, you know, this stupid thing could have waited. I wish I would have just gone out sewing and knocked at some doors because 
whatever it is that I decided not to go out soul winning for didn't pan out or, or it was just kind of stupid and useless anyways. I mean, who cares if I you know, move some furniture around or whatever? I mean, just thinking of, of anything that's just that's not that important. And you end up wasting some time, and it's like, why didn't I just go out and serve God? They're, you're never going to be let down, ever. When you're serving God, you're never going to look back and be like, man, I wish I didn't do that. At least you should not. I, I can't imagine how you could ever think that way. I mean, you lead a soul to Christ, someone who's on their way to hell, and, they, and, and you preach the gospel to them, and they say, you know what? I'm going to put my faith on Christ. I believe that, yes. And they pray to God, and they ask Jesus Christ to save them. How could you ever look at them and be like, man, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I didn't help them out. I wish I didn't show them the Bible. I mean, you change a soul's life forever. We need to remember that. Keep that in mind. You're never going to be upset with yourself for serving God. But you will get upset with yourself. You can by doing things just, just other than God. Now, I'm not saying that you can never do anything else in your life. But, but just be careful that you don't let that... that well, you said you can, I can never not do anything else and just always do everything else. You don't want to get to that point. You, know, you, you want to make sure that you can at least keep yourself balanced, but God wants you... Look, I'll tell you this right now. If you just feel like really comfortable in, in how you serve God right now, then you're lukewarm. If you just, if you just feel like everything's just fine and that, no, yeah, I don't think I need to serve God anymore. I think everything's just going good and you got everything just planned out. You got your schedule just fine. Everything's just going just perfect. And I've got this time I read the Bible, this time I go soloing, and this and, and, and everything's just great, and I am serving God to my full potential. You're not. You're lukewarm. There's always going to be times where you're going to have to give sacrifices. There's always going to be things that you just have to say, you know what? I just need to go out and do this. I need to just kind of forsake some of these other things I'm doing. I need to go serve God. And it's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be something that you could even just have just completely mapped out and just say, this is, all, this is just the perfect fit, and I'll just always do this, and I'll just live comfortably getting through. Now look, you ought to be serving God anyways. I mean, <laughs> whether you're comfortable or not, like you need to just continue to serve God. You need to continue to do soul winning, but try to push yourself to do more. Try to get that zeal. Try to be zealously affected. As I mentioned earlier, you know, serving God, it's not always going to come easily. There's going to be times where maybe you have to stay up a little late studying the Bible. You want to learn something. You want to know something more. Hey, you might have to stay up. You might have to sacrifice some sleep. That's a little uncomfortable, right? It's not that much fun. I just did it last night. I was up pretty late preparing some sermons, okay? But you just got to do it. I mean, if you're going to serve God, if you're going to do these things, you have to say, you know what? Who cares about the stupid sleep? I could get some more sleep later. Just, you know, whatever. I'll be fine. Or, or I could do whatever it is later. I could just I could deal with that later. Right now, I'm just going to serve God and I'm going to do it. You know, sometimes you might have to sacrifice something else that you wanted to do to go out and knock on people's doors. And say, well, I had something else planned for this. I wanted to, I wanted to you know, read this book or, or, or whatever. You know what? Sometimes you just have to give that up and put that other stuff on hold. Whatever the case may be, don't allow yourself. Don't let yourself become lukewarm. Um... Turn, if you would, please, to turn to Numbers, chapter number 25. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers, chapter 25. I'm going to read for you from Matthew, chapter 8. Matthew, chapter 8, verse 19 says, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. As he's talking to Jesus Christ. And Jesus said unto, saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He's warning him. He's saying, look, I want to follow you. I want to serve you. Right? This guy, the scribe comes up to Jesus and says, I want, I want to serve you. Wherever you go, I'm going to follow you. So Jesus warns him. He says, okay, look, if you're going to do this, if you want to serve, if you want to serve me, hey, look, just understand. The foxes, yeah, they have holes to go into. They have homes, right? The birds of the air, they have nests. He says, I don't even know where I'm going to lay my head to. He's like, I don't have, a, I don't, I'm homeless. You don't have anywhere to go. So just understand, again, not having a place to lay your head, that's uncomfortable. Not knowing for sure where you're going to be, that could be uncomfortable, right? But if you take him by faith, if you're going to want to follow Jesus Christ, it may not be comfortable, but hey, you're going to get closer to Christ. You're going to be, you're going to be doing what he wants you to do. And just because a task may seem a little bit difficult or may seem uncomfortable, don't turn away from it. Don't stray from it. Don't allow that to turn you away from serving God. We saw in Revelation that we need to be zealous and repent 
Because if you're a child of God and you do not repent, he's going to rebuke and chasten you. I mean, he said, I, I chasten, rebuke and chasten every child, everyone I love with you. Everyone I love, I rebuke and chasten is what he said. So, um, you know, we need to understand that and just make sure that we don't fall into that. Now, let's look at some examples of people who had zeal in the Bible. Because this, this is the goal of sermon. Again, don't, don't, I want you to remember this. We all ought to have this zeal. We need to be zealous and repent and just... And just just get on fire for serving God and do more with our life to serve Him. Look at Numbers 25. Look at verse number 5. It says, And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Now, just a little bit of inside the story, you know, the children of Israel were sinning. And here's this man. He just basically, you know... They weren't supposed to, to marry the, the heathen that, were, that surrounded them. They were supposed to go in, and they were supposed to keep themselves separate. They were supposed to be a sanctified, holy people unto God. They were not supposed to go out and take wives of the heathen that were around about them. But they did. And God was cursing them for it. And then this man, he says, this guy came out. He had a Midianite-ish woman. Didn't even care. It was right in the sight of Moses, right in front of everybody. Just real brazen, just coming out and just being like, here I am. You know, like, what are you going to do about it? And um, just in the sight of everyone. So Phineas saw that. And Phineas is just like, he had a zeal for God. He said, he rose up, he took a javelin, and he went and he killed him. And this was serious business. Now, you would say, wow, I can't believe they killed him. Now, I can't believe that. I mean, it's not something that you, you really want to do. I'm sure nobody wants to go and just take someone's life. But this was something that needed to be, needed to be done, and God praised him for it. What he did here was the will of God. It says um, at the end of verse 8, So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel, and those that died in the plague were twenty and 4,000. See, because of the sin that was going on, and, and especially by this man, 24,000 people died from this plague. But it stopped when, when he killed that, those, those people, when he killed those two people. That stopped the plague. It says in verse 10, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore, say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. So God praises him for doing this. He says, you know what? Because he did that, I like that. Because he's zealous and just, and just decided, you know what? I'm not going to let this stand. I'm not going to let this keep going on. I'm going to do something about it. He got up. He did something that needed to be done. It was not a fun task. It was not something that's pleasant. It was not something that's, that sits well with people. <laughs> But it was something that needed to be done, and it was something that, that God praised him for doing. He was zealous for my sake. Now, I'm not telling you to go pick up a javelin and just start killing people. Okay? <laughs> Don't misunderstand me here. I'm not just saying, okay, we just need to start killing people, right? But in this situation, this is what that called for. At this time, that, that is what, what God wanted them to do, and, this, and that was righteous in that situation. So um, this is an, an idea where God, God blesses them. He gives them that, that everlasting priesthood, that covenant that he makes with them. Hey, I see how zealous you are. Good for you. I want you to be priests. I want you to be, to be, to be leaders, to be the priests that, that are going to expound on, on my word. If you're going to serve me that zealously, I want you serving me. And you're going to be like at the top of, of, of um, you know, the priesthood basically for, for serving me that way. Now let's look at 2 Kings chapter number 10. We'll see the story of Jehu. Second Kings chapter number 10. We see people who are zealous for serving God. 2 Kings chapter 10, look at verse number 15. If you're there in 2 Kings 10. 
Verse number 15 reads, And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him, and he saluted him, and said to him, Is thine heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? And Jonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the chariot. He, he took him up to him into the chariot, and he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him so they made him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him, according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. So again, he's serving God here, and, and, and this is another example where it involves killing people. Right? He slew all of them that remained unto Ahab. Now Ahab was a wicked king of Israel, and, and God prophesied when because he had done things so bad, he said, You're not gonna have any of your seed to remain to, to be on the throne. And he was basically God said he was just gonna wipe out the house of Ahab. Mm -hmm. And what Jehu did was he came and he fulfilled that. He fulfilled that prophecy from God. And he was doing and notice what he says here in verse 16. He says, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. That's what he said to Jehonadab. He kind of says, come with me. And you know what? That's the way that, that we ought to be. Hey, if you're zealous for God, tell other people, hey, come with me. Come with me out, soul winning. Come with me. Hey, see my zeal for the Lord. Hopefully some of that will rub off on you. You can see this. Come out with me and let's go do that work together. Come with me. Let's go do this. Right? I'm not going to stand up here and tell you, you need to be doing all this stuff. You need to be serving God more. You need to be going out sowing. You need to be reading your Bible if I'm not doing it myself. That's hypocrisy. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, hey, come with me. Come with me when we go out knocking on doors this afternoon, when we go out Wednesday afternoon, when we go out Saturday. Come with me. Come with me when, you know, see, see my zeal for the Lord. And hopefully you can see that and take notes. And that's why we were looking at Paul. That's why we're looking at these examples. Let's see these people's zeal. Look at how they served God and how they did it with such zeal and, 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 and with such spirit that they were willing just to do whatever it took. They were just, just you know, God, it's not, it may not be a pleasant thing that you're asking me to do, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to fulfill your will. And then in verse, jump down to verse 28 of 2 Kings 10. It says, after all this stuff that Jehu does, it says, thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. Baal is a false god. Baal is a devil, right? And these people were getting involved in worshiping idols and worshiping Baal. And because of Jehu's zeal for God and all the work that he did, he destroyed Baal from out of Israel. He just got, he, he eliminated it. It's a great work for God. Um, let's look at John chapter 2 back in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 2. We're going to see Jesus' zeal. Because Jesus also had a great zeal. And we're going to see that fulfilled in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, look at verse number 14. John 2, 14 reads, And found them in the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge, a scourge is a whip, a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So that's that scripture, the Old Testament scripture, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They were, they were applying that to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ comes into the temple, and here's what he sees. In another verse, he says that, you know, that God's house is supposed to be called a house of prayer to all nations, and you have made it, um, you know, a den of thieves. He says that he comes into the temple, he sees these people. Now, they're selling and they're buying. There's people buying and selling stuff. And these were all things that were there to sacrifice and to serve God with. Sheep, oxen, right? These are all things they would use in sacrifices. And he was, they, these people were all in there just, just conducting business. Now, it doesn't mean they were doing anything dishonest. But the fact of the matter is they were in the temple doing these things. He said, you shouldn't be doing these things here. They, get these things out of here. It made him so angry. He had so much zeal for serving God. He had so much zeal. He said, you know what? He just made a whip. He saw what was going on. He sat down, he made a whip with small cords, and he just started driving them out. He flipped over the tables. He's like, get this stuff out of here. This doesn't belong in God's house. 
Get it out of here. And he whips them. He drives the cattle out. He drives the sheep out. Get this stuff out of God's house. This doesn't belong here. You're making my father's house a house of merchandise. Hey, God's house is not a place where you sell stuff. And I don't care. That's why in our church, we don't sell any of the materials. We don't sell the Bibles. We don't sell the DVDs. We don't sell any of the materials here. We're not going to make God's house a house of merchandise. And I'll tell you what, if you've got a business, if you've got other things, don't go around talking to people in the church trying to sell your product to them either. I'm not going to stand for it. God's house is not the house of merchandise. I don't care what you do for a living. If you sell for a living, don't you go around trying to just, just get more sales out of people at church. Whether it's the church selling things, it's wrong, or whether it's you trying to sell things in church, it's wrong. God's house is a house of prayer. It's a house where you can come in and pray. You can hear God's word preached. We'll sing praises unto his name. We'll edify each other, build each other up, learn, but we're not going to sell anything here. It's not the house of merchandise. Jesus had that zeal when he saw that. He, he drove everyone out. He said, you know what? Something needs to be done about this. And in every situation here, we see there's wickedness going on. There's sin going on. And when they were zealous, what happened? Someone stood up and said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm not just going to sit back and watch all this wickedness happen. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do something. That's zeal. That's having a zeal for God. Now, it's important to make this note. I'm almost done here. It's not just enough to have zeal. Zeal's great. Zeal means you're passionate. Zeal means you're really involved. Getting excited about serving God is exactly what he wants. But look at Romans 10, if you would. Flip over to Romans 10. You're in John, John X, Romans. Look at Romans 10. God wants you to get excited to serve him. He likes seeing that. He likes when people get zealous. And they're not going to stand for it. They're just going to say, you know what? I'm going to do something about this. But it has to be according to knowledge. Look at Romans 10, verse 2. It says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. He's talking about the Jews. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So it's, it's, it's definitely possible for people to be passionate, people to be zealous about serving God and completely doing it the wrong way. See, if you're doing it the wrong way, if you're doing it the way that God has laid out, if you're doing it contrary to the way God has laid out for you, God's not going to be happy with your zeal because you're, you're not even doing it right. See, a lot of people, there's a lot of false religions out there. There's a lot of people who are real zealous for pushing their false religion. But that zealous, that zeal isn't good because they're, you know, they're doing it wrong. They've got the wrong message. They don't have the truth. They're not really serving God. They have a zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. Just as the Jews, they had a zeal for serving God. Hey, they were real zealous about keeping the commandments. Right? A lot of these Pharisees, a lot of these Jews, they would be zealous about it. Paul said he was zealous before he got saved. I mean, he was going after the church and persecuting him, thinking that he was doing God's service. He thought he was doing right, but he was completely wrong and was just doing actually the contrary. He was damaging the cause of Christ. So we need to have zeal, yes, but make sure that it's, it's the proper placed zeal, that it's, that it's done, that you're serving God according to the way that he has laid out for us. Um, turn, if you would, the last place we're going to turn is Galatians chapter 4. There's a few more, a few more books over to the right in your Bible. Galatians chapter 4. After 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you have the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you, that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected, always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. So you're saying, look, these people, you know, they're zealously affecting you, but that's not, they're not affecting you well. They're, they may have a lot of zeal, and they're, and they're influencing you because they're so passionate. And you can hear a lot of preachers dynamic preachers that, that, that get passionate and they're up here screaming, they're yelling, and they're speaking from the heart and you can say, like, man, that's powerful. But just always remember, don't let the, the presentation, don't let the, the way that they're speaking and the passion affect you unless it's according to knowledge, unless what they're saying is actually right. It's, it's, I mean, there's, there's lots of great speakers in this world that can, that can be eloquent of speech and can say things in a nice way and maybe be kind of convincing, but just always make sure it's according to knowledge. 
And it's, he said, and it's good. It's good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Um, lastly, the last thing I want to point out is we need to be careful not to get this attitude as a Christian that you've arrived. That, you know what? I'm, I am super Christian. I read my Bible. I spend this much amount of time reading my Bible. I go out soul winning this much time. And I do this much praying. And I do it all the time. I do it regularly every week or whatever. And just be like, here I am. I've arrived. Because you haven't. There's always more than you can do. God wants, He doesn't want you just getting satisfied and just, just coasting and saying, like, that's when you get lukewarm. That's when you actually, and actually lukewarm just leads to backslide. When you just think that you're complacent, everything's just fine. You know, and maybe you are serving God. And I hope so. Maybe you're serving God. Maybe you're excited about Him. Don't lose that excitement. Don't lose that zeal. Try to, try to stay zealously affected. God wants you to do more. God, God always wants us to do more. Because I think about my own life. There's so much more I can be doing for God. But it's just a matter of, of prioritizing things and, and making sure you're keeping your focus on the things that truly matter. There's a lot of, a lot of things you'll be spending your time with in your life. A lot of things. One good way to look at it is just think, fast forward to the end of your life, when, when maybe analyze, analyze what you're doing. Analyze what you did last week. Think about everything you did all last week. Fast forward in your brain to the end of your life where you can look back on all the things you just did in the past week and say, did I regret anything? Did, did I really do as much as I could have done? Is what I decided to spend my time on, was it really that important? Or was it not? And, and when you start thinking maybe in some of those terms, you can start thinking, okay, well, maybe I need to make some changes. Maybe I need to do things a little bit different. Maybe I need to make sure that I'm, that I'm putting aside the right time to serve God. Maybe I, you know, maybe I need to do that. And analyze that for yourself. Uh, everybody, I mean, we could all probably do that and say, yeah, you know what, I need to do more. Because <laughs> I know that I need to do that. And, and I don't know. I mean, hopefully, hopefully you grab something from the sermon tonight. You know, take the warning seriously. You know, God, God will... Will rebuke us, he'll chasten us if we're not, if, if he thinks, if he thinks that we're lukewarm. If you think in God's eyes you're lukewarm, hey, he's gonna rebuke you and chasten you. It's gonna happen. I mean, he loves you. He wants you to do more, he wants you to serve him more. But um you know, don't even not even if it's just not for the for the sake of the rebuke and chastening, hey, get on fire for God, and you won't regret it, I promise you. I mean, the time we spend out, Brother Matt got got led a, a, a person to Christ today. Hey, who cares? It could have taken four hours for that one person. You could look back and say, like, I could, we could have skipped our, our lunch. And if that, if that person got saved, it's all worth it. I mean, look back at that and say, you're not going to say, oh, man, well, I wish we would have just eaten that lunch instead. It was pretty good. The lunch was really good. <laughs> it was. But, but you look at that, I mean, a soul saved, hey, that's priceless. I mean, that's, that's eternal value. That's something there. And I'm not, you know, we had a feast. We had a celebration. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just look at your own life, look at your own time and how you're spending it. Are you really serving God to, the, to, to your potential? Are you serving Him as much as you think that you could? Let's bow our heads and we'll prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for all that you've done for us, dear God. The least that we can do is really just, just kind of prioritize our life around you um, um, with the primary focus so that we can make sure that we're making the right time to serve you that we're not just getting too, uh, too wrapped up in our own um, comforts and, and what, you know, the things that just feel comfortable and that just keep us feeling lukewarm. God, help us to turn up the heat. Help us to, to turn up our zeal um, by, by a large factor to just really do a lot of work for you and really get a lot of things done. God, I know that everyone here wants to be used by you. I know we all have a desire that, that we're going to be in your will. God, help us to understand that will. Help us to just, to just get the right spirit. Renew our hearts. Renew our spirits within us today, dear God, and throughout the week. Help us to stay focused on the things that matter. And Lord, uh, we love you, and we thank you so much for all the, the wonderful truths that you've given us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.